Good afternoon. Welcome to the Bible Doctrines Bible Study Hour. I'm uh, Evangelist Joel McGarvey, and I'll be here for the next hour. And uh, we would like to welcome you on this uh, cool fall day, wherever you are. And I know wherever we are, it's kind of rainy and cool, but uh, we're glad you're here, and we're going to spend some time uh, in the Word of God. Uh, let me just go through our regular weekly announcements concerning Bible doctrines to live by and who we are. We, are, of course, are an evangelistic Bible study uh, ministry located in Comstock Park, Michigan. That is just on the northwest side uh, of the city of Grand Rapids. And uh, if you're ever in the area, stop by and see us. But we uh, not only do we travel and do uh, camp, uh, conferences and uh, vacation Bible schools, uh, but we also are a printing ministry, and uh, we print a, a lot of Bible study materials. Uh, actually, for I would say for all ages, including all of our materials, but primarily for the upper teens and adult ages, uh, we have a lot of, of Bible study material for that age, those ages. Um, and then we have uh, gospel tracts and. Uh, really seasonal tracks. We're coming into the Christmas season, and so we have uh, Christmas tracks uh, available, and we'd encourage you to go to our website and see those, uh, what are available there, as well as uh, Halloween and other seasonal type uh, tracks, as well as just simple gospel tracks and uh, doctrinal tracks uh, that we have available there. And so we'd invite you to go and take a look at that. And then we have our graded curriculum. Now, that is primarily thought of as a Sunday school material, but it could also be very e easily used as a homeschool. We have some homeschoolers are using that. We have uh, some people using that just for their family devotional time. Um, and so it is, uh, we have some for all the way from, from young uh, children all the way through teens. And uh, that is all available uh, on our website, and so uh, we'd invite you to go there. Uh, we also have a catalog, and uh, you can get one of those free of charge. All you need to do is call us at 616-785-361818. Let me say that again, 616-785-3618, or you can go to our website at bibledoctrines.org, and just click on the uh, store, and uh, you'll find a catalog there, or you can find some uh, other articles that are there, past issues of Truth of Flame magazine. Uh, that is our uh, magazine that we send out free of charge. If you are not on the mailing list for that, we'd invite you to give us your name and address, and uh, you will begin receiving those. And like I said, we send those out uh, free of charge. And... Uh, and then just ask for a free catalog and call us and uh, we will be happy uh, to send that to you. And then we're beginning a new uh, area tonight and uh, beginning tonight and tonight at seven o'clock, actually, uh, we will have our first ministry spotlight. And so we are going to have a special guest in uh, from uh, another ministry and uh, we will share, he will share with us. Uh, his ministry with them as well as he moves forward. All right, for today's Bible study, uh, I want to take you to the book of Philippians. I want you to go Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to pick up there right from the very beginning, but we're actually going to go through uh, chapter 1, and primarily uh, we're going to uh, somewhat build on what we were talking about last week. In our study, and let me say, as we talk about last week, uh, I I am uh, blessed uh, from the comments that we received from last week's uh, broadcast, and the number of people that that tuned in. Um, it is just a, it's a blessing, and I, I give the Lord the the, the thanks for that. Um, it's been something that was on my heart, something I've wrote written about uh, the the truth of flame that's coming out somewhat reflects the same thought, but it's something that I think is sorely missing uh, in the body of Christ, 
and we don't have we don't have uh, we don't function as a body. We don't function as a family, and we don't get along very well. And you know, very often we talk about the the gospel of grace and the graciousness of God, and and how we we so appreciate the grace of God in our lives, and yet very often we don't respond to others uh, in a very gracious way. And and um, I think we need to really deal with that subject of forgiveness. And uh, I, I had a, I had a, a, a text message from a, a friend this week who commented on that program, uh, how much they appreciated the program itself, but learning the difference between forgetting and just not remembering and, and choosing to just not remember anymore. And so today as we come to Philippians, I'm going to begin in verse 1, and we're going to go rapidly through the first part of the chapter. It just builds as it goes, so we can't really start in the middle of the chapter, but I really want to concentrate on more on the end than the beginning, and the end really fits somewhat with where we were last week and, and the need of, of, of action on our part. And so... Uh, Go to Philippians chapter 1, and having found that, let's pray. Father, we are truly thankful today for who you are. We're thankful for your grace and for your mercy and for your love and the life that we have in Christ Jesus. We're thankful, Father, for the freedoms that we enjoy and the, the freedom we have to, to come together in an avenue such as this and uh, to, to come across the Internet, uh, to use the Internet uh, for good, rather than evil, and uh, to just share the Word of God. Uh, not our thoughts, but just what's the Word of God say? And uh, so, Father, we are just so thankful that you have given to us this opportunity today. And so now, as we open your Word, we ask that you would grant to us wisdom and, and knowledge and understanding, insight into your Word. And, Father, we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. As we begin Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and, and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, as we open this, as we open this chapter, as we open this book, and, and we see the Apostle Paul as he sends his greetings to the, to the saints there in Philippi, uh, one of the first things that we have to see is his love for them, his, his care for them, and the fact that, uh, that he, he, they, are, they are a people for whom he is praying. And, and you know, we talk about that so often. And, and if you're involved in, in, in Facebook, and, you know, Facebook is one of those things that it, it can be a real center for gossip. <laughs> It used to be a place where basically all we shared was, was what we had for supper. Uh, but we've gone, we've gone into that, and we've gone past that, and now it's heavy in politics, and it's, it's heavy in, in, in sports, or it's heavy in just gossip and, and false information, and, and so much there, and, 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 you know, and, and so much uh, negativity is shared there. And, and we can get the idea that Facebook is a waste of time. Uh, Facebook's a tool of the devil. Uh, we can get all kinds of ideas. But you know, at the same time, here we are. We're using that same avenue uh, to confront the devil, amen, to, to, to preach the word of God, to give out the truth of the scriptures. And, 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 and also on Facebook, it's a place where people share share their their needs and 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 we can pray for one another 
And we hear that so often, would you, would you pray for me in this? Would you pray for my uncle in this? Or would you pray for our church? Or would you pray for this? And you know, very often, we click, we click and comment back, praying. I will pray, I will pray. But you know, I wonder sometimes how many people really do. You know, I, I really try honestly, and I, I, don't, I don't say this to brag, but I really try that, that at least when I, when I say that, I will pray for you, that, that just right there mentally, I pray for that person. Right there, right then. <coughs> and then I pray as I, as I think of them and, and, and throughout the day or, or the time. But I really try to make it a habit that just as I'm typing the, the words, I will pray for you, that I'm praying for them right there at that same time. But here's, we, we need to be, we need to be a, a people that are praying for one another within the body of Christ. We need to pray for one another within the body of Christ. And, and the Apostle Paul says, upon every remembrance of you, I thank my God for these people. These people were, were special uh, to the Apostle Paul. These were people that <coughs> this, this church that he had begun out by the river and, and he had suffered there in prison and yet these saints in Philippi were, were standing with him and, and it were these saints in Philippi that would, would c- communicate with him and, and, and pray for him, but even more than pray for him, they, they financially supported him the Apostle Paul, and, and were there and, and met his needs, as he'll say later uh, at the end of the letter, that time after time you, you met the need that I had, or time after time you met the need of others. And, and so the Apostle Paul's talking for the, these people. These people are part of the body. And, and the body of Christ is, is a group of people that ought to be caring for one another, um, Truly those that are in Christ, those who have experienced the grace of God in their life should be those who are caring for one another, one another lifting up one another, uh, helping one another, praying for one another. And, 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 you know, as Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, he says, you know, when one hurts, we all hurt. When one has joy, we all have joy. Uh, that's the way the body of Christ comes together together and functions together as a, as a single unit. In that same passage to the church of Corinth, Paul would say, if we're all eyes, where would be the hearing? If we were all uh, noses, where would be the, uh, the, the seeing? You know, we are not all the same thing. We are all different fingers on a hand. We're all a hand. We're all an arm. We're all a leg. We're all a foot. We're, all, we're not all an eye. We're all not all ears. But when that all comes together as a body, then it has function, it has, it has purpose. And, 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 and Paul here is urging these people, and, and he's talking about their, their fellowship in the gospel from the very beginning, from the very beginning, and, and his confidence in them that, that the thing that God began in them at the very beginning, he will continue to do in them until the day of Christ, until the day the Lord comes back and catches us away to be with him. And that same hope and that same promise is, is there for us as, as we come together, as we are busy in the work of God, and as we are busy carrying out his that message of grace and carrying out the word of God and putting the word of God into practice in our life, sharing the word of God, then we can be confident that that which God began in us, he will continue to work in us until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 says, even as it is meet for me to think of you all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the uh, and confirmation of the gospel, you were partakers of my grace. You stood with me in prison and in those times of debate and defense uh, and confirmation of the gospel, you were there. You were standing with me. You were standing behind me, beside me, around me. You were there, and you were praying for me. Verse 8, For as God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. 
in all the mercies, the, in all of that of Christ, in all of that, I, I wish, I wish, I long to be with you all. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. There's that day of Christ. Till the day that we are caught away, may we stand uh, sincere and without offense. Must stop and just go back here for a moment. Paul's prayer requests for them that their love may abound yet more and more and, that, and more in knowledge and in discernment, in judgment. You know, sometimes I think that we're lacking that in the church today. Real knowledge, real discernment. Uh, we hear a preacher. I had someone tell me uh, just this summer, uh, they were talking about someone and how they use the Bible. They use the Bible. They, they, they're really good. Why are they? Well, how do you know they're really good? How do you know? Well, they use the Bible. And, and you know, there are, there are cults in the world that use the Bible. But they twist it and they turn it to, to suit their own purpose. There are people in, in churches today who would carry a Bible who really are, are not understanding what God is saying to them. They are not using discernment. And when, whatever the preacher says, well, that sounds good. Let's take it in and, and we can live that way. And, and you know, in the end, very often, that, that lack of knowledge and that lack of discernment really turns to frustration. It turns to discouragement. Um, it turns, and actually, it can turn people away from Christ because all oh, these promises all these promises that are given to me, all these promises that are given to me, and well, wait a minute, they didn't work. They didn't work. And we have those today that are, that are proclaiming a prosperity gospel and, and give, 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 and God will give back to you. Let me tell you something. The next time you hear a preacher say that if you send me $1,000, God will send it back to you tenfold, he doesn't believe that for one second. If he really truly believed that, he would send you $1,000 and allow God to bless him tenfold. But, but we have all of these promises and then all of this prosperity. And generally speaking, the only people that experience prosperity are the preachers. Everybody else is basically poor. But they have big houses and they have big airplanes, and they have multiple homes and multiple mansions and sometimes multiple planes and, and cars and staff and all of that. And that's because we have a lack of knowledge and a lack of discernment. But in verse 10, Paul would say that you may approve the things that are excellent. And that word approve goes back to that same idea with discernment or judgment. And it's talking about that you can distinguish between this and this. And, and, and then he says the things that are excellent, the things that, are, the things that differ. And in, es in essence, what he's saying here, that you can distinguish the things that differ. In other words, what he's saying there is that you can put into practice in your own Bible study. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, distinguishing the things that differ. Distinguishing the things that differ. For most of you, what I'm about to say, you will right readily understand. Some of you may not. But all of Scripture is given for us. All of Scripture is given for us, but not all of Scripture is specifically addressed to us. We can learn from all of Scripture, but we have to discern that part, that promise that was actually given directly to us. That's why we need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. I picked up a cup from, from Randy White's conference last week, and it says, rightly dividing the word of truth, and that will sit right there. That's what we always have to do. We have to rightly divide 
the word of truth. We need to, as verse 10 says, approve the things that are excellent or distinguish the things that differ. Why? That we may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. The only way we can truly stand sincere and without offense is if we truly learn to rightly divide the word of truth or distinguish the things that differ. And so we have to understand that as we come to the word of God. In this passage, to whom is God speaking? To whom is God speaking? You could put your finger way back here in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, and you could come all the way over to the midsection of the book of Acts, and you would say to yourself, everything in that section, everything in that section is primarily addressed to the nation of Israel. God is dealing with the nation of Israel during that section. It's when you come to the writings of the Apostle Paul that God is speaking to us. And even then, you have to rightly divide what is being said. And so in verse 10, he says, distinguish the things that differ. At verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus under the glory and praise of God. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. The things that have happened to me have happened and they've happened, but the cause has been the gospel has gone forward. The gospel has gone forward. You know, we talk about the times in, in which we're living now, and, and uh, people are worried about the suppression of the gospel. What they're really meaning is we won't be able to go to church anymore. But, but even in those times of, of history, when, the, when, the, when governments have, uh, or, or even religious organizations have suppressed the truth of the word of God, Underneath all of that, there's been an underground church. And very often, the church has known its biggest growth during times of oppression. During times of oppression. And, and here, Paul's saying exactly that, that all of these things that have happened to me, the prison, all of that, has fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. Then he says in verse 13, so that my bonds... Uh, in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. Here it's given Paul a, an opportunity to witness and to preach. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Not only is Paul now preaching, but there are others who are out there because of his boldness. They are bold and they are preaching as well. Some indeed preach Christ out of uh, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. And, and there are those who say that what he's talking about in verse 16 there, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. They're not preaching the truth. They're, they're preaching a false doctrine. And those of verse 17, those are preaching the truth. But I would offer you this possibility that in verse 16, there are those people out there preaching the truth, but they're only preaching the truth because they think in some way it's hurting the Apostle Paul. In some way they're getting back at him. Maybe they're doing it out of spite. Maybe they're doing it out of vainglory. Maybe they're doing it, but they're doing it for the wrong reason. And then in verse 17, you have people that are doing it for the right reason. Then you come to verse 18, and he says, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. What Paul's saying here is, I don't care why you're doing it. I don't care what's motivating you to do it. Just get out there and do it. Just get out there and do it. And Paul's rejoicing that it's being done. And very often, I think that's what we need in the church, the body of Christ. We need some of that boldness. The boldness that rubbed off of the Apostle Paul needs to rub onto us. 
We need to have a boldness to truly stand for the word of God and stand for the word of God rightly divided. Oh, right away you're talking politics. I'm not talking about politics. Yes, indeed, the word of God addresses much of what we can see in the area of politics. But let me tell you something, folks. If we spend all of our time in the political arena attacking one, two, or three issues and not getting to the heart of the gospel, which is the death of Jesus Christ, and preaching the gospel that Christ died for sinners through his death, burial, and resurrection, they can have life and life everlasting. You can change all the laws in the world, and you, but you don't change the heart of man. Your battle will never be over. Your battle will never be over. And we need to get out there and preach the gospel. Oh, yes, we vote. Oh, yes, we post our signs. And oh, yes, we stand for this issue and we stand against this issue. But the issues cannot be the end. The end is the preaching of the gospel. The end is the preaching of the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. The end is seeing souls come to Jesus Christ. The only way you will change the heart of man is through Jesus Christ. The only way you can change the thinking of man is through Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And we need to get into the Word of God, and we need to get the Word of God into people, and we need to preach the truth of the Word of God without fear and with boldness. For I know, he says, that this, what? This that he's been talking about in verses uh, 12 through, through 18. This shall turn to my salvation, my deliverance through your prayer. That's back to prayer and supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. That's what we need. That's our need. And later on he says, my God shall supply your needs according to his riches in glory. We need to stand for the truth of the word of God. We need to stand with boldness for the word of God. And we need to proclaim the word of God to a pagan lost nation. The United States of America. That's where we need to begin. Folks, if you're, if you're a resident of the United States, and I know some of you listen from around the world, but wherever you are, you are a missionary to that nation, to that country, to that state, to that neighborhood, to that street that you live on. You are a missionary to that street, and we need a boldness to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God to the wicked world in which we live. Verse 20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness and always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life, or by death, for me to live is Christ. Is that true for you today? Is that true for me today? Is my life Christ? Is that the purpose of my life, Christ? For me to live is Christ? For me to live is Christ, it's not Joel. Joel died. It's Christ living through me, and I need to acknowledge that and, and live that way. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Yes, we may, have, we, may, we may have advancement in this life. We may have temporal gain in this life. But none of that is to compare, be compared to, to what, we have, what we have in store for us, the glory. And the glory that is to follow. And, and our gain, we're not looking for our gain here, we're looking for our gain there. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is service. For me to live is to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. For me to live is to preach the gospel. My gain comes later. My gain comes later. We have too many people in the prosperity area, are looking for their gain here, their gain now. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what, I, what shall I choose? I what not, for I'm in a strait. I'm in a strait. I'm stuck between two, having a desire to depart 
and to be with Christ, which is far better, far better. Paul had that desire, oh, how I want to just get out of here. Oh, how I want to go home to be with my Lord. Oh, how, how great that is. What the gain that is there. Oh, I can't wait. I want to go there. I want to be there. I want that in my life. Oh, just take me home. Take me home. Take me home. And I've heard people pray that. And I understand that desire in Christ our body longs for and groans for that when this body will be taken away and taken home. And I understand with all of the heartache and all of the things going on in this world today, I understand people would say, I want to go there. I want to be there. I want to go home. I just want to go home. But verse 24 says, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It's more needful for your neighbor. It's more needful for your coworker. It's more needful for your, for your neighborhood, for your city, for maybe for your church. It's more needful for your country, for this world. It's more needful that we remain in the flesh as his ambassadors. We have a calling that is here. We have a purpose, a God-given purpose that is here on this earth to share the glorious gospel with the grace of God with a lost world, a world that desperately needs Christ, a world that lives in a time that's drawing short. Their opportunity is near past. And it's needful for them that we remain and that we preach the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and the joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, the, the faith of the gospel. Paul says, only let your conversation be as it becometh, as it adorns, <clears throat> as it promotes the gospel. Of Christ, And that word conversation there is the word conduct. And Paul is urging the Philippian believers, he's urging us as members of the body of Christ, watch our conduct. Make sure our conduct adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be certain that our, that, that our conduct doesn't detract away from. And, and see, this is where I said, we kind of piggyback over last weekend when we're talking about the idea of loving and the idea of grace and the idea of forgiveness and the idea of, of not forgetting but, but not remembering, of, of being kind and long-suffering and forbearing and, and putting up with. And, and that's, that, that's that attitude as we go out into the world and we encounter those who would who would oppose us. We encounter those who would maybe laugh at us or mock us or those who, who may come against us in any way. And, 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 and we need to be careful with how we conduct ourselves in the world but so that the world hears and sees Christ living through us as his ambassador, as his minister, as servant of reconciliation. You know, if, if all the world, when the world looks at me, what do they see? A songwriter said, when the world looks at me, may they see Jesus. But if the world looks at me and all they see is themselves, what do I have to offer them that they don't already know, that they don't already have? When the world looks at me, they need to see something that they don't have. They need to see a peace. 
They need to see a, a joy. They need to see a, perhaps a, a smile. They need to hear a, a greeting. They need to hear a word of kindness. They need to hear a word of love, of concern, of care. You know, I, I'm afraid that we, we fall into a trap very often of emulating the world in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this evil time, this evil day. And I think we forget that. And we talked about that a little bit last week and the week before. We forget that, that our enemy is not the individual. Our enemy isn't that idiot. Why did that idiot do that? And, and we get so wrapped up in, in the name calling that we forget that perhaps that idiot needs Jesus Christ. Perhaps that jerk needs Jesus Christ. You know that one that you blow the horn at and wave at as you go by? Maybe they need Jesus Christ. I, saw, I, I read a, a, a little funny not too long ago about the police officer that pulled a woman over and arrested her and took her to, took her to, the, to the precinct. And she said, what, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? He said, you know what you did? You know what you did? Well, what did I do? And he took her down to the priest, precinct and she said, what did I do? And he said, well, I saw the way you reacted to those people that, that cut in front of you. And I saw the, all of these this actions on your hands and, and waving at them and cussing them out and blowing your horn and shaking your fist at them. And then I noticed the bumper sticker that it said, Honk if you love Jesus. And I figured with your actions, you must have stolen someone's car. You know, it's funny. But is that what the world sees in us? Is our conduct that which becomes, adorns the gospel of Christ? Then he says here that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And I think what he's talking there is he's directly talking to, to those who rightly divide the word of truth. Because what he's talking there is the faith, not just faith. Not just faith in Christ. But he's talking about the faith. That body of truth that he had delivered to these Philippian believers. That body of what we call the grace of God. The grace, mercy, and love of God that, that sent Jesus Christ to, to die in, in my place and in your place and to, to pay the price of sin. That grace of God, that power of God that would, would cause him to be buried and, and then rise again the third day, victorious over sin, death, and the grave, raised for for our justification, and as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, then able to reconcile the whole world unto himself. And in that, he isn't saving the whole world, but what he is doing is making the entire world savable. And only a loving, gracious, and kind God could do that. And for those who put their faith and their trust in that finished work of Christ, for those who trust in him, he then gives them that, that indwelling presence of, the, presence of the Spirit. He then seals them in Christ Jesus. He then gives to them that, that hope of eternity in heaven. And he would say that for those who are in Christ, we can be absent from the body and we're present with the Lord. 
That's what we have in Christ. That's that faith in Christ. And, that's, and, and there's just so much more that we have in Christ. In fact, to the church of Colossae, he said, would say, I am complete in Christ. There's nothing I need to do to add to it that in Christ I am complete. I have the righteousness of God upon me. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. That's the faith of the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, not a gospel. It isn't the faith of a gospel. It is a faith of the gospel. And let me tell you, there's only one gospel in this age in which we're living. There's only one gospel in this age in which we live. And that is that simple gospel of faith, of trust, and belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that our sins were taken away, and that he was raised again the third day for our justification. And when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, in the gospel, we are given life and life everlasting. We are given life and life under, uh, everlasting. That is the gospel. The gospel isn't just love God. The gospel isn't believe in God. The gospel isn't ask Jesus into your heart. The gospel isn't pray a prayer, to pray a sinner's prayer. Anybody can pray a prayer. I was in a, a service not too many years ago where the speaker had everybody stand up and repeat the sinner's prayer. And when he was done, he said to the group in the audience, if you've done this today for the very first time, you're a child of God. And I wanted to jump up and say, wait a minute, no, no. They didn't pray that prayer because they necessarily believed that prayer. They didn't pray that prayer in faith. They didn't pray that prayer in trust. They prayed that prayer because you told them to. That's not the gospel. The gospel isn't found in praying a prayer. The gospel isn't found in just believing in God or believing in Jesus. Life is found as we put our faith and our trust, our belief in the finished work of Christ. We're relying on that and that alone for our salvation. In his death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. And that's what Paul's saying here, for the faith of the gospel, the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an advent token of perdition, but to you of salvation, of deliverance, and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Oh, now there's a great promise, isn't it? But you know, in, as we look at the life of Paul, we see the, the fact that he was shipwrecked, that he was beaten, that he was left for dead, he was imprisoned, he was spit on. But in his boldness, he called all of that a light affliction, not to be compared to the glory that would follow. To Timothy, he would say, all those who live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, we here in America have been blessed for many years. We've had a freedom to, to, to worship, a freedom to preach, a freedom to travel. And we see that ebbing. We see that slowly, slowly being infringed upon, slowly. And, and, and maybe we can see the day when that might be gone. I don't know. Maybe. We don't know. But we've been blessed. But let's just pretend for a minute that is taken away, then what? I would like to sit here and say today that we will continue on. 
we will continue on doing what we're doing and you know, let the chips fall where they may. I don't know. I would, I would pray to God that I would have the boldness to do that. But I would pray to God that I would have the boldness to be willing to suffer for the one who died for me. The one who died for me. And so as Paul opens his letter to the church at Ephesus here, he is striving to push the, or to, to Philippi here, he is striving to, to, to bring these people to a position of, of unity, of oneness, of, of kindness one to another, of supporting one another in prayer. Listen, if, if one person over here is suffering, that suffering can be tempered by knowing I have a group of people over here praying for me. And when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. We labor together. We work together. And that's what we need in the body of Christ. We don't need division. We don't need division. We don't need people saying one thing here and another thing here. We need unity. We need to come together in meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, and failing to remember <laughs> about one another and conduct ourselves in such a way that it adorns, it becomes the gospel of Jesus Christ. May that be true in all of our lives as we go through our lives each day. May that be true in your life. May that be true in my life. Let me just remind you again, as we draw this hour to a close, we have a few minutes left. Let me just remind you again of uh, our travels and the need for prayer there. Pray for us, as we do for you. Pray for this ministry, that God will continue to use it and bless it. We are just so thrilled by the way God has blessed this, this video ministry thus far and how we see God's hand at work expanding this ministry, giving us additional opportunities uh, to, to reach others of, of all ages, and we have that coming, all ages, uh, to the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, pray as we put the final touches on the first step in November as we work the details out of how to do that. Uh, we're new to this whole thing, using multiple sources and multiple cameras and getting people who can help us uh, run those things together. Uh, so pray for us as we do that. Pray too as we put together this other program beginning in January um, and, and that God will use that and bless that. And if that truly goes uh, well, uh, we can do more of those, not on a regular basis, uh, on a semi-regular basis uh, as to what that is, but then also as Susan puts together some things and others put together programming, we want to saturate our time uh, with the Word of God uh, for all ages and the Word of God rightly divided. So pray for us as we do that. Pray for us, and with even I will be so bold as to say, the financial needs of this ministry. God has blessed so far. Some of you have uh, said, I will take that on on a monthly basis, the, the, the needs that are here. Uh, the internet, I'll, I'm honest, I mean, we pay for the internet, uh, and God blessed us by reducing our fee this week, and we're thankful for that, but that costs money, um, and, and uh, we have that, and then we have just the, the purchase of equipment and setting up and keeping that running and adding more equipment to that. So there are needs, and, and I would say that if you would like to help us uh, with that, you can send your tax-deductible gifts to Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, zip 49321. And just mark on the note, this is for the broadcast expenses, and that will go into that fund and only be used for that fund. But uh, if you would like to do that, we would uh, greatly appreciate that. If you'd like to support us, uh, Susan and I, in our ministry, 
uh, Matt in his ministry, um, Cindy in her ministry, uh, Carolyn in her ministry. All of us function by the support of people that appreciate what we're doing. If you'd like to do that, you can send that gift to Bible Doctrines and just mark it for Joel, for Matt, for Cindy, or for Carolyn, and, and that will go into their uh, monthly support uh, as well. But keep that in mind. If you'd like to help with the broadcast, uh, mail your gifts to Bible Doctrines to Live By, Post Office Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. Just mark on there whether it's for the broadcast or whether it's for uh, support for one of our people, Joel, Matt, Cindy, or Carolyn, and uh, we will greatly appreciate uh, your help. So until we meet again, uh, let me close us in a word of prayer, and uh, we will see you again uh, next week sometime. But let's pray. Father, we are truly thankful today that we've had this opportunity to come together once again for the Bible study hour. We pray that uh, your word has touched all of our lives and that we will seek to live our life in such a way that brings honor and glory to you, that we'll be faithful ambassadors, faithful servants, always ready to give that testimony to others, to the hope that we have uh, in Christ Jesus and to share the glorious saving gospel of the grace of God with a lost uh, neighbor, a lost co-worker uh, in, within a, a city, a state, a nation, and in this world. Father, just go before us now. Use us, each one, each day, for your honor and glory. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.